Allison here with the Critical Bench um, Weekly Muscle Building Expert Interview Series. Today I'm here with Brad McLeod. Brad, how are you? Yeah, doing great. How about yourself, Luke? Doing all right. I, I appreciate, appreciate you joining us today. Um, I want to give you a second, first off, to sort of introduce yourself to people that might not be familiar with you, sort of talk a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, Brad McLeod. Uh, I live uh, here in Atlanta. I work as a CrossFit trainer, um, also uh, work as a SEAL Fit Kokoro coach, and a uh, former Navy SEAL. Got a website, uh, SEALGrinderPT.com. And uh, yeah, I just I love training, and I love the whole mental aspect of it, and I love to write about it and uh, coach other athletes. Very cool. We're going to get deep into a lot of that different stuff. Um, First off, I came across the website. What is Steel Grinder PT for people that haven't seen it? Yeah, well, it's got kind of a, a strange name. Uh, I know I've had people call it Steel Grinder Pit, uh, or just they they don't really understand, you know, what it is. Uh, but uh, Seal uh, uh, stands, you know, it's uh, for the U.S. Navy Seals, and that's uh, the Seal is uh, Sea, Air, and Land. Of course, uh, you know, Navy Seal is adept in the water, but also, um, you know, parachute. Uh, halo in, um, you know, drop gear and whatnot, and then also do a lot of land-based, uh, you know, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq or, or even your, your anti-terrorism work. Um, and then the uh, the grinder, that's um, in the Navy, a, a grinder is, um, you know, a concrete or an asphalt area. Uh, it can be a parking lot, and in the case of what, uh, you know, uh, we had at BUDS, which is basic underwater demolition seal training, the school there, the grinder, is uh, an asphalt concrete area that we worked out in every morning. And it uh, it's, uh, has uh, pull-up bars. It's surrounded by pull-up bars in classrooms, and, um, but pull-up bars and dip bars. And, of course, in the beach is just a few, uh, few feet away, and then that's where we would you know, we'd work out every morning on the grinder and then we'd go do pull-ups and dips, and then we'd go on a, you know, whatever, four-mile run, or we'd go to chow or uh, go on to the uh, obstacle course or what have you. And then PT is just the military uh, term for physical training. So you put that all together, SEAL Grinder PT. Uh, it's just uh, a Navy SEAL-style work, workout using body weight exercises. So that's, that's in a nutshell. That's what SEAL Grinder PT is all about. And obviously this developed over time having – you know, the fact that you went through SEAL training and things like that. But then you also sort of, you know, looked at other things and now you've, you know, I guess made a service out there for people to, to sort of interact with. How did that come about? Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, going into the Navy, I had trained, um, you know, in, a, in an old school, uh, you know, sort of a bodybuilding, uh, powerlifting gym. And so I had... Um, you know, uh, as a training manual, I had the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, Education of a Bodybuilder. And, uh, you know, this is all, you know, pre-CrossFit. This is late 70s, early 80s. And, um, you know, that's what I knew. I knew you go in the gym and you work out hard. And I knew I had to run and, and do pull-ups and whatnot also. Um, so, um, you know, I trained super hard in that gym. Uh, luckily, there were some guys there that were into powerlifting. So I learned the squat. I learned the deadlift, uh, you know, the bench, all of that. Um, but of course, a lot of you know, I did a lot of curls, a lot of preacher curls, things like that that may not have served me so well in the Navy. Um, but of course, then I went went there to the Navy um, SEAL training, and, and in buds, you know, we don't use any barbells. Uh, you never touch a barbell the whole time you're there. You do, you know, obviously you do a lot with a pull-up bar. You do a lot with dips, but everything there is uh, body weight. Um, you know, you do a lot of stretching, a lot of yoga. Um, they don't really call it yoga, uh, but it's uh, um, in, in terms of where you meditate, you do yoga positions, but you just do a ton of body weight. You do squats. You do push-ups. Uh, you do every configuration of, of um, you know, ab, um, core type workout. And um, so, you know, um, you know, for those that, that do know my story, I went through Buds the first time, and uh, I got kicked out. I was over halfway through. I went through the notorious hell week. Um, I'd gotten all the way into dive phase, well over halfway, and I, I failed a test. And um, which you know it was you know it was really hard for me. You know I ended up going to the fleet for a year, and uh, in terms of you know mentally kind of crushing me, it 
you know, initially it was pretty hard. But um, what ended up happening though is I went to the fleet, went to the Navy, and instead of going back to my earlier barbell days, I uh, was forced to, not only did I know from Bud uh, that I needed to do body weight, but I was forced to because on the ship we didn't have a nice set of barbells. And even if you do, as you can imagine, on a Navy ship out in the Pacific Ocean, you know, with 30-foot waves, you can't really work out that easily, uh, even with a spotter or even with any kind of weight, you know. And um, so what I did is I got a mat and I did what I call like a small space workout. I would just get down. Uh, there was a little weight room, but I really would get down in that room with a mat and I would just do tons of body weight prison-style workouts based on butts. Uh, what I did there. And so, you know, I went back. Um, uh, I finally made it through. I went through the BUDS training. Uh, I was in much better shape this time. Even though the time before I didn't fail any, um, you know, any physical test, I failed a math test. But uh, I went through, and uh, from then on, it kind of changed some of the ways um, that I looked at training in that, you know, the type of um, warrior that I was prepared to be was um, – you know, a long-range endurance, grind it out. You know, a lot of your SEAL-style missions are going to be, you know, one, two, three-day missions. So you've got to be able to run, run long distance. You've got to be able to carry a pack long distance. Um, you've got to be able to move your body weight very efficiently. And so um, even though I still lifted weight, uh, because that was where my roots were, I lifted a little bit less um, than I did before. But kind of where I'm heading with all that is eventually over time, uh, I uh, had found uh, CrossFit. You know, I'd worked out in my, my, my gym. I've got a bench uh, there, and I've got weights and whatnot, and I did a lot of more of the small space workouts out of my garage. But over time, I found CrossFit, and that fit in really well with my overall conditioning, you know, general preparedness uh, type of uh, workouts that I needed to do. So... From there, I took the CrossFit and kind of blended that back into the small space workouts, the BUDS workouts. And then the more I read over time, then that's when I became more influenced by, say, uh, uh, Jim Jones, uh, of course, you know, Mark Twight, uh, his gym. And in particular with Mark Twight, you know, he's a, he has a climbing background, and that was uh, some of my background, too. I uh, was trained to be a climber in the Navy. Uh, you know, to climb ships, to climb cliffs, what have you. And so when I got out of the Navy, I climbed more and more, you know, rock climbing, bouldering, whatnot. And so his style of training, which really kind of came out of CrossFit, uh, the Jim Jones style, then uh, I began to look at his workouts, take adaptations from that, blend that back to CrossFit, to the body weight stuff, also take some inspiration from Rob Shaw, um, you know, military athlete, and kind of begin to put together these workouts where we would have, you know, rut marches, uh, sled drag workouts, body weight workouts with running, things like that, and really mix it up where every day was different, um, but that these were workouts that would help prepare you for, um, you know, whether you're a military-style athlete or you're a martial arts guy that, you know, you're going to be in, uh, you know, three rounds of five minutes, what have you. Um, these were still, these were all workouts that could help you build overall fitness to, to help you kick butt, you know, in whatever your day-to-day -day task was that you worked. Policeman, firefighter, SWAT, uh, military, you know, martial arts, it could help you in any of those. Absolutely. That was, that was great. That, that leaves me with, with one of the main questions, which I don't know that people necessarily want to know the answer to, but I want to know the answer to, and that's when you break down your training to sort of body weight versus, you know, weight training you know, machines or barbells or what have you, that has to be sort of at the impetus of the very specifics of what you're about to do. As you mentioned, you can't lift on, on a ship in 30-foot waves. You're not going to be doing barbell training at BUDS. Talk a little bit about that and how you have to sort of respect the, the, spe the specificity of, of what you're going to do. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you'd have to look at, you know, where is, you know, what is it that you're going to be doing in your training? Like, I, you know, I have athletes all the time that, you know, they have a military background or whatever and say they're just trying to pass a military 
um, you know, PST or a PFT, a physical standards test. Um, or I have someone else that's you know, passed the test and now they're getting ready to go for, you know, special forces selection. So, you know, there's, what I kind of look at is uh, there's two different things where, you know, if you're just training for the BUDS test, I look at that as like a CrossFit Metcon, metabolic conditioning, a short, fast, quick, you know, a workout like that you're going to do in 20, 25 minutes or what have you. You're not going to need to be out there pounding uh, serious mileage uh, in terms of running. Uh, you're not going to have to be super strong. So there may not be that need, say, for you know, the heavy deadlifts or the heavy bench press or heavy squats. Uh, so if you're training for, you're, you're kind of drilling down to that specificity with the athletes that I train uh, in general. I mean, I train a lot of athletes. You know, I have a young baseball player that I'm working with him, and I have uh, uh, you know, a couple of older guys was in my garage gym earlier. He's 53 years old, you know, and he's, uh, he's training for an upcoming long-distance uh, event. But going back into that specificity is we look at that PST, uh, that PFT, what they're trying to do with that. Uh, we test them through uh, to see what their scores are. And then from there, we try to bring their scores up. And a lot of times you'll find that, you know, uh, your average guy can, you know, do the sit-ups. They can do um, the run pretty well. It's usually the push-ups or the pull-ups that they may need help on. And so then from there, that's where we would go back in and, um, you know, we would work specifically on what we call the goats. We would work on the weaknesses and try to bring those up. Um, you know, um, likewise, you know, if you've got another guy who, I've got one guy that was at my gym this morning. He's already passed his PST. So right now we're trying to bring, he's going to buds. We're trying to bring in a lot more long, uh, longer endurance type activities. We may have him running three miles. We may have him running six miles. We may have him doing a lot of longer CrossFit style workouts, even like something like a Murph, a workout that may even last, you know, 45 minutes or to an hour. You know, put on a vest that may be an hour plus, um, and then we may he may rest a couple of hours and may go out and pound another hour workout. And uh, so, but you know, with him, we would have to. Uh, drill down again and, and try to get into some specificity and see, you know, where are his weaknesses. If he's a super strong runner, you know, probably not going to prescribe to him uh, some running ladder to, to bring him up and, uh, you know, to get his running better. Whereas, you know, if he, uh, you know, let's just say he, he's relatively weak, he needs to put on a little bit, little bit of weight, then that's where I would definitely bring in the barbells, bring in uh, you know, some of the, 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 the uh, CrossFit style workouts, maybe even go to like a starting strength, um, you know, uh, put them on a starting strength type program with shoulder press, uh, squats, uh, bench press, uh, deadlifts. Uh, so a lot of it depends on the athlete, but we also test them all the way through, find out where their goats are, find out where their weaknesses are, and keep looking at that final objective. Um, so again, there's two different uh, kind of two different paths we see, one for the athlete going at that, the PST, one that's gotten past that, now they're looking to train more longer endurance to try to go to buds or go to SF selection. So, Right, and that, that's all very sort of dependent on, on your goals and that's yep. things you need to have in mind and, and right. different things like that. Um, you mentioned Jim Jones. You mentioned that mountain athlete. Um, those are, you know, people that I've talked to previously. Um, these are very, very different places. I, I'm really not sure, you know, sort of how to explain it to people. Um, just it would be very difficult for you to do sort of something like that in a regular gym. Almost certainly you would get kicked out. You would have to oh, yeah. show, you know, some impetus to sort of have some of the equipment. Um, talk a little bit about that. Just sort of the difference in the mindset and the, the sort of, you know, trying to be more aware of what they're doing versus someone else possibly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, think if I, I think I understand your, your uh, question, but, you know, I, I used to do, uh, one time I got trained in the L.A. fitness. I know I don't cringe too hard, but uh, temporarily I did. I trained out of my garage, but just to kind of freshen things up, I'd go out to L.A. fitness or whatever, probably because they had the pool and I could swim there. Um, 
But, you know, you're not going to be able to do a lot of times a CrossFit-style workout in an L.A. fitness. They're, uh, you know, the whole, you know, box jump, wall ball shots, um, you know, uh, throwing th- kettlebells, a lot, just the equipment alone, you're not going to have that there in, you know, a traditional um, you know, box uh, that's there. You know, likewise, even here at my garage gym, you know, we, uh, we had uh, a body weight style workout that we rocked out for a while. Next thing you know, we're, we're uh, running up the street with sleds. One's a metal sled, uh, <laughs> the other one is, uh, which makes a lot of racket. And my neighbors were all, like, they were all looking over the, the hedges to see what was going on. And, um, you know, the other one's a tire. So all my, neighbor, my neighbors think I'm, you know, a crazy freak. But, um, but yeah, that style of workout, like you're going to – I haven't specifically myself, I haven't been inside of Jim Jones. I've seen a lot of the videos and, uh, you know, just from what the, the type of training they do. I mean, obviously, very hardcore, um, you know, it's a, almost kind of a very solitary gym and that, you know, it's, um, you know, all of the athletes there, very determined. Uh, a lot of times it's by invite only. Um, you know, there's no mirrors in there, there's no lounge, there's no, you know, it's not meant for comfort, it's meant to get in, uh, get a serious hardcore workout, uh, no bullshit, no, no, no talking or, you know, socializing, so to speak, uh, it's not a social place to meet, and then uh, you're up and, and you're out of there. Uh, but I think also, too, you and I exchanged uh, emails, and uh, to kind of take that a little bit further, too, with the, with the awareness is, you know, a lot of the athletes that I train, um, you know, these are guys that are going to SF. These are guys that are going to, to Buds. And, um, you know, a lot of the – they're not there uh, to uh, you know, come into my training because they want to look better in a swimsuit or they're getting ready for their, uh, you know, 15th, uh, you know, school reunion or something. They're not there to look better. These are athletes that this type of training is uh, – it's very internal. It's a lot of times going to be related back to the work that they do. So they may be, you know, again, firemen, SWAT, police, um, you know, special forces, Navy SEAL, what have you. So the type of training that they're doing, their awareness level is at, say, a whole nother level in terms of, uh, you know, when you speak to them, you know, they're, um, you know, they're internalizing this information so much more. They're also putting out at a whole other high level. I mean, just in general, I mean, my guys know. I mean, you, you don't hear the, the dreaded words like can't or even when you mention to do a certain exercise, they, you don't get these uh, shrugged shoulders or somebody looking down or like, oh, man, I hate burpees. So there's a whole other level of awareness, uh, uh, confidence. And, two, you know, they're taking this information in. You know, even though it sucks, the workout they're getting ready to do, I mean, here today, it was like 95, 96 here in Atlanta, you know, steamy, hot, nasty. They could have been inside. Uh, they take this to heart because they know this type of training is something that's going to help them. And the more that they train now, say in peacetime or when things are good, that's the less that they're going to sweat when they're out there on the battlefield. I mean, these are the, you know, the type of training they're doing now can help keep them alive. It can help, you know, um, help keep their buddy alive. So it's... Um, you know, there's a whole nother level of, uh, you know, you're, we're not in there just to go and uh, coke and joke and hang out and, and um, socialize. It's, it's like, hey, man, we're going in. It's, it's almost like, you know, the Spartans, uh, the gladiators, they go to wrestle or they go to, uh, you know, their, their gym, uh, gymnast, uh, uh, gymnastic type of a, an event or, or they're out, uh, you know, uh, say, in their um, mock battles or whatever, these guys go at it, man. They're throwing elbows and they're, they're uh, you know, really into it. And the same way, I, you know, I see, you know, these athletes that we're training, whether we're, you know, Phil Fit Kokoro or here out in the driveway or at the local track, I mean, you've got, you got guys and gals that are super pumped and uh, really to get into it, get after it. It's just amazing the sort of difference, you know, um, as you mentioned, the people that sort of self-select, I, I wouldn't dare sort of put a number on how many people there are, you know, sort of in the United States or in the world that would really want to do something like that. But it's very, very small. But that's where, you know, the most interesting, you know, work and the most interesting preparation is, I think. So that's why I, I thought it was important to, to have that explained, certainly. Um, Another thing is just mental toughness. You mentioned it earlier. 
um, want to get into a little bit of, of that, certainly. Um, what is mental toughness? What does that mean exactly? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you kind of, if, if you sort of, if you want to Google that or try to find definitions or whatever, there's a lot of definitions. It's kind of hard to quantify at some level, but I think in general, uh, my take on it is it's just, you know, having a certain sense of calm when, uh, you know, bad things are, are happening all around you or, you know, you're, you're facing, uh, you know, something that you fear. You're facing, uh, you know, say, could be everything from a, national, uh, a natural disaster, you know, all the way to uh, that most feared opponent in, in jiu-jitsu or, or uh, in wrestling. Um, to maybe, a, you know, it could be a, a, just a super gnarly 12-mile uh, uh, trail run in, in the mountains. I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, I mean, also, you, can, you know, over into the battlefield. Um, so having that, having that sense of calm uh, and collectiveness and to say uh, not back down, um, you know, from that fear, being able to move forward uh, with poise, uh, when you're when you're up against uh, you know what looks like an, an unconquerable foe, um, so I, th I think that and I, I'd also myself I, I kind of like to throw in there just you know um, mental toughness too is you know when you get knocked down uh, not only when it's you know it's in a fight it's, you know you get pinned in a wrestling match or you get submitted in jujitsu um, or say you're in a a CrossFit wad and you're just absolutely devastated in the heat, and you, I mean, literally down on your knees. Uh, it's that ability to get back up and not beat yourself up. It's that ability to get back up and go back at it again, uh, go back at that task again. So it's uh, really, you know, it's never quitting. It's never backing down. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, you know, that for me, that's, that's sort of, that's my interpretation of it. Which is really interesting because I don't know that I've ever heard, you know, someone that actually really needed mental toughness actually define it. So I think that'll be, be quite valuable for people. How do you actually develop mental toughness? I mean, there are different schools, there are books, there's philosophy. How does that process happen? Well, you know, I think you can read about it, um, you know, in depth. Um, which I think is good at some level because I think it can give you a certain level of awareness. Uh, whether you read a story like it's uh, you know, Aaron Ralston with the, you know, the, the young man who had his uh, arm pinned uh, in between a boulder uh, and they had to cut his arm off. I mean, that's, we're talking about the extreme level of mental toughness there. You know, that's a little bit different than getting submitted in a jiu-jitsu match. Or you read about the, uh, the Chilean uh, miner who, uh, you know, the runner who, you know, tied a, took wire and wrapped around his waist and tied it to a pallet and he ran through the, the mines to kind of keep his mind off the fear and um, the, um, you know, just the dread of, of you know, I could die. Uh, he's trying to keep his mind off of that. I, you know, I see that as mental toughness. But you, you can read about it a lot. I think that helps. But you have to actually go out and practice that. And, um, and, and go in and engage yourself with physical training. I think physical training is going to be, um, you know, that is the medium of where you need to be to develop and condition your mind. And so, obviously, we're not going to go out and pin ourselves uh, against a boulder and, you know, see if we can cut our arm off. That's obviously that's crazy. Uh, we're not going to go down deep into a mine with a tie wire on a waist and, and go run with a pallet either. Um, but there's, um, you know, j just general physical training um, is a good start to develop mental toughness, to develop mental conditioning. This may be something that you slowly ease into. It could be, uh, you know, working out in the, the, uh, the back barn, you know, with uh, bench press and, uh, you know, maybe going on a uh, on a run down a country road, and it's it's um, you know it's 98 degrees or whatever. Yeah, you know, I'd use caution. You know, you want to move into something like that. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to you'd want to keep ice and water and things like that, and, and go with a buddy. But you can slowly condition yourself physically to be able to withstand tougher and tougher physical activities. 
um, there are a lot of conditioning methods that you can use. I could, I could, I just gave a lecture last week at out at Silset, and uh, they kind of had to cut me off <laughs> at about an hour and a half. There's a lot of different methods you can use uh, for mental conditioning, whether it's visualization or affirmations, uh, mantras, uh, deep breathing. Uh, you know, a lot of that sounds like California New Age stuff. Uh, you know, something that the you know, the hippies would think of or whatever, but actually if you go back to the Apache Indians, um, your martial artists from a thousand years ago, uh, your Spartans, your gladiators, uh, they all used mechanisms like this. They used visualization. They saw themselves conquering their foe, fighting through the battle in their mind. Those were the best fighters. The best fighters knew how to breathe deep to condition, uh, to uh, um, take their mind um, and slow down their mental uh, brain waves even to, um, uh, you know, the brain, the mind will follow the breathing. Obviously, when someone's breathing shallow or super excited, you don't want to be super excited, say, before you go into battle. You want to calm yourself. Same thing with affirmations. You don't want to go in there, you know, oh, I'm never going to beat this guy. Uh, I'm not going to make this free throw shot. Uh, you know, I'm not going to make this, you know, 450-pound bench. You want to go in with affirmations. You see yourself making that bench. You, you tell yourself, I will overcome. And so, uh, but that mental toughness going back in is that it can be trained through physical training, through taking steps, you know, over time, uh, increasing load, increasing uh, distance, uh, increasing even, I use temperature, I live, you know, live here in the south, I use, you know, sometimes I'll go try to train, I'll go run a, you know, a trail run in, in say, the middle of the day, or I may get do a CrossFit wad uh, out on my street, uh, I may drag a sled, my neighbors totally think I'm crazy, but I'll drag a sled on the asphalt on my street in the middle of the day, full sun, you know, here in July and August. I use the heat, use the temperature as a mechanism to, uh, drill deep into my body, into my mind, uh, so that when I do come into a competition uh, next month, I'll be able to, you know, withstand the heat, both mentally and physically. So, um, you know, just in a nutshell, I would say physical training and then using those mental conditioning uh, tools of visualization, affirmations, mantras, uh, deep breathing to, uh, to push yourself through that, that tough spot. And there's definitely some you know, scientific research and some evidence to, to support you know, that we can do a lot of those things and cause changes you know, physiologically and, and things like that. Um, but it is the, the application, sort of as you described it, you know, the, the looking at different methods is still you know, sort of the mystery, you know, how you get what you need. Does that seem to make sense? Possibly. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, this is still a relatively new, um, you know, these are still relatively new ideas into, as to what we've really completely grasped and how to apply it. Um, you know, just recently, um, you know, the IMG performance, uh, the big uh, NFL uh, camp where the, all the guys go down to the, uh, before they go to Combine, the guys all go down to Bradenton, Florida for the uh, the IMG camp there, and that's where they prepare these guys for you know your vertical leap, uh, your sprints. They they do all sorts of lifts or whatever. They have world class coaches that are there. Well, here in the past few years, they an actual position that is there is a mental conditioning coach. I kid you not. And um, there's actually several of them there. And now what's happened is not only your professional athletes uh, are able to um, have access to coaches like this, but even your college level, uh, you know, your top level programs, um, you know, you can even Google, say, like uh, Florida State. Uh, Christian Ponder, good example. He's just uh, taken the first round of draft, plays with Minnesota Vikings, or will play with the Minnesota Vikings. Um, he had a mental conditioning coach that was brought uh, up from Bradenton, from IMG, to help their team, of course, help Christian Ponder, and then Christian now has access to him while he's there at Minnesota Vikings. So, you know, this was something that, you know, 10 or even 20, 30, 40 years ago, say in football, 
was really not uh, – you didn't have a mental conditioning coach. You had a coach there that was probably kicking, in your, kicking you in your ass and telling you to, you know, put out more or, you know, dig down into your gut or whatever. Um, and, and that's good stuff. But, you know, these guys actually come in almost kind of like a horse whisperer, and they come in to these athletes meeting with them and kind of drill down and find out, you know, what are the issues. Say if it's a pitcher who, uh, you know, was throwing great, a professional level pitcher, and now he's throwing balls in the dirt, uh, or a top hitter, you know, who's, uh, he, they have the ability, they have the strength, they have all the skill in the world, they're just a little bit off. But say they've, uh, you know, they um, had a few too many strikeouts or what have you, and they've got something in their head that is blocking them, they're saying, well, hey, they, you know, it could be something that's just as, you know, negative, subliminal thoughts that are coming into their head, and, and they're saying, you know, wow, I'm, I'm up here, you know, I'm at uh, home plate. Um, man, I, you know, what's going to happen if I strike out again? You know, am I going to lose my contract? You know, I've got a million-dollar contract or what have you. And a mental conditioning coach can come in and uh, be able to sort of compart- help an athlete compartmentalize those negative um, um, sort of pulses, those ideas that have come up to the front of the mind and be able to put those all the way back into the back of the mind, compartmentalize them, and sort of sweep them into the back corner. I mean, Michael Jordan, perfect example of that. Uh, Tiger Woods, you know, all these top athletes, you know, their skill level may be just a little bit better or maybe about the same, but mentally they can handle tons and tons of pressure because they know how to take the negative that tries to flood up into the front of their mind. They sweep it. They pull that negative all the way to the back, sweep it all the way into the far back corner, and even I've heard terms like they put it in a safe and go ahead and spin the knob. You know, they, they, they actually visualize in detail what they did with that negative thought. They put it in that back corner in that safe and spun the knob so there's no way it could get back out. And when you, when you deal, you know, when you're, you're thinking of an athlete that's, that's at that level with that level of skill, I mean, they have no fear. You know, they have uh, no fear of failure. Um, you know, they're, they're playing lights out, and, um, and, and, and that's one of the top things that, that mental conditioning that enables them to win over another athlete who's really almost about the same level as them. And those are going to be the ideas that are going to sound familiar to people, you know, throughout different points in history and, you know, different languages and different sort of wording. You know, I think that that's that's essentially timeless. Doesn't matter what game you're playing. That's something oh, yeah. that we've been, we've been looking for for a while. Right. I think we have to rediscover it every so often. There are a lot of things like that, but uh, yeah, that's how it that's how it goes sometimes, I guess. Um, yeah. One of the final final questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, I I think of buds as being, you know, the thing that gets you ready, you know, kind of like the combine, something like that prepares you to be a really sort of the elite professional athlete, to be a SEAL, to be an operator. It seems like that's the culmination of a career. And it always seems like, you know, people in the NFL, people in the NBA that don't want to retire, they hold on too long. What did you want to do after being a SEAL, or did you have a plan sort of going into that? Yeah, you know, I, I had that uh, as – my main goal in life, uh, coming out of high school, um, that's what I had wanted to do. I read a book about it. Um, you know, I tried to get every bit of information that I could, so I definitely had my sights set on it. But one thing I was very fortunate to do is, as I was doing that, I told myself, you know, um, I want to go to college. I want to have the military pay for my college. And um, so I kind of I had a backup plan. I... Um, and so when I went forward with this goal, um, you know, I did have a, <laughs> I had a big major uh, step back, uh, so to speak, when I failed out the first time, and that really kind of threw me for a loop. Um, but, yeah, I was able to save my money. I was able to get ready, you know, go on to college. Um, you know, I, I, just, I guess I didn't really see myself as being, you know, say a career military person. Um, but the, what I was going back to, you know, tying back to the very first thing I said, you know, had another goal. And I wasn't trying to look too far ahead, but I think the key there is, is that 
I think a lot of times we have athletes, and I have them that come in the gym. We had some guys that uh, went to climb Mount Rainier, um, you know, uh, this, this past year. And uh, they went up, they, they climbed Mount Rainier. It was super tough, really hard, and uh, they did a great job. Everybody came, came back, down, uh, back down to, uh, you know, the base and eventually made it back to Atlanta. Everybody was safe and fine. And um, it's interesting, by, you know, in the next month, pretty much slowly, uh, all of those athletes, you know, stopped coming to the gym. And I saw one of them on the street, you know, later, and I asked him, and it's like, you know what? I, you know, I asked him, why, why, why are you not coming to the gym anymore? And he's like, you know what? I, I didn't have a new goal. I I'd, I'd climbed the top of the mountain, and I didn't have a new goal. And, um, you know, I think that's so important for, you know, a lot of athletes that are out there, or even business people, is that, you know, it's so great to have that goal, that kind of top of the mountain that you look towards. And you, you go up and you climb it, and obviously even coming back down, a mountain can be you know, incredibly dangerous too, so you have to have your wits about you. But once you get back down into the valley, you know, then you, you know, the pace slows and you get back into more of mainstream life or whatever, you need to, you need to reset. You, know, you need to reset and kind of look back up. Look for that next mountain. It may actually be a physical mountain. Instead of climbing uh, you know, um, Mount Everest, it may be you're going to go do K2. Or instead of, do, uh, instead of placing, you know, uh, third in an event, this next year you're going to come out, you, you know, you're going to play second or, or free, even first. You're going to shoot for first. Um, or even if you want to pick up a new, uh, a, a new sport, say, say you're into CrossFit or you're into running or whatever it is, say so you're going you're to pick up, uh, you know, some, a new martial arts or whatever. I think we all need to be aware, um, you know, of that ever-ending uh, process that you want to evolve into your higher and better self. And so if we do get to that point where, you know, we kind of plateau out, um, which, you know, can happen with everybody. It, it happens even with the best athlete. Those best athletes, they can reset and have a new goal and move forward again. I think, you know, her, for me, Herschel Walker is that example. You know, look at, look at Herschel. And I know a lot of people can say, ah, you know, he doesn't need to do that. He could just you know, go kick back in the islands or, you know, man, he could just go out and do whatever he wants. Why does he keep, uh, you know, obviously before he, he played uh, college football at the highest level, Heisman Trophy winner, went on to pro ball, uh, did really well there, several, many years of success uh, in professional football. And then uh, from there he was in the U.S. bobsled team. And then now he's, you know, he's an MMA fighter. And, um, the guy is just in incredible, phenomenal shape. I mean, even to this day, he's still doing his, you know, 1,000 push-ups a day and 1,000 sit-up workout. I can't remember what it is. It's just a huge amount of volume. Um, but he, he, inside of him, has this burning desire to continually evolve and to continually go to look for new goals to push himself to that better and higher self. I mean, gosh, think about it. He could have won, you know, they won a national championship, uh, the Georgia Bulldogs won the national championship. He won the Heisman Trophy. I mean, for many people, that's just the end-all, be-all in life. You know, I mean, gosh, you know, how many Heisman Trophy winners are there out there? But, you know, for him, he went on to pro ball. Uh, he went on to the U.S. bobsled team. I mean, continually evolving, continually searching down deep in his heart, in his soul, in his gut, and finding that new, that new spark to drive him forward with that new goal. And I, I just I think that it's really important to uh to not plateau to to uh to find that next step in that journey, that lifelong journey. You know, martial arts, they talk about that a lot, you know, the the lifelong journey of, of steps and learning. And uh so I, I think it's in us all to do that. We just gotta fight that urge to go sit on the couch and uh and uh, kind of rest on our laurels. So I think we should always be evolving trying to to learn and uh, and and force ourselves to be better. Definitely, I, I think that's a great response, and still, you know, very personal. You know, just the way that whatever it takes, you know, you'll know the answer. Um, that's it. That's all the questions I had. Um, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, let people how to know uh, the way to get a hold of you and sort of where you are online. Those type of things. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, www.sealgrinderpt.com. 
Uh, you can just type that into Google. You'll find that. It's a pretty unique word. And uh, I answer all emails. It's just uh, brad at sillgrinderpt.com. And uh, I have athletes from all different, you know, it's not just SF. I've got uh, guys who are wrestlers. I've got, um, you know, I could think of, uh, you know, I've got guys, a surfer down in Jakarta. <laughs> I've got, you know, all different uh, types of athletes that, um, you know, uh, send me questions, ask me things. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more than open to, um, you know, I, I do have a coaching program, but I, I, I just – I love uh, helping people, working with people. I know that's uh, that's the only way I made it uh, through Buds is with other people helping me, and uh, so that's kind of you know I feel like uh, that's part of my mission in life too is to to help others. So definitely check out the site. There's free workouts on there every day, and uh, hit me up with an email. I'd love love to hear from from all y'all's uh, readers at Critical Bench. Brad, thank you again. I appreciate it. All right, yeah, thanks so much, Luke. It's been a great honor to, to, to be on the show with you. Greatly appreciate it. All right.